Welcome to the uh, IISS this afternoon. Uh, for the purpose of the uh, video recording taking place, my name is Rahul Roy Chaudhary. I'm the Senior Fellow for South Asia and the Head of the South Asia Program at the Institute. This session is titled Crisis in the Maldives Impact on Indian Ocean Security. This is the first talk that the IISS has organized on the Maldives. The reason for this is that as an institute that prides itself on fact-based, impartial research, as well as independent expert analysis, we feel there is not sufficient understanding of the ongoing political crisis in the Maldives, currently under a state of emergency. Nor is there credible policy-relevant analysis on the expansion of Chinese influence in the Maldives and its implications for regional security. This is especially important in view of the strategic location of the 1,000-plus coral islands of the Maldives lying astride the major sea lines of communication in the Indian Ocean between the Strait of Hormuz and the Strait of Malacca, Singapore. In this context, some of the key questions are, what is the extent of the po current political and constitutional crisis in the Maldives? What is its impact on security and stability of the Indian Ocean? And finally, how best to overcome the crisis and ensure stability in the region? To examine these issues, I am personally delighted to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Mohammad Jamil Ahmed, the former Vice President of the Maldives. Dr. Jamil Ahmed served as the Vice President of the Maldives from November 2013 to July 2015. Earlier, he had been Minister of Home Affairs from 2012 to 2013, Minister of Civil Aviation and Communication from 2008 to 2009, and Minister of Justice from 2005 to 2007. Prior to his political career, he had served as the Chief Judge of the Criminal Court of the Maldives. The format we will be following today is that the presentation will be on the record with the video recording made available online for our international membership and others. But the discussion session that follows will be strictly off the recording and the video will then end. Sir, the floor is yours. Esteemed members of British government and the academia, senior fellow for South Asia at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, Mr. Rahul Roy Chowdhury. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good, good afternoon to you all. First me, firstly, let me extend my heartfelt gratitude to the board and faculty members of IISS for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I am truly honored to stand before you all, especially during another crucial turning point in the political history of the Maldives. This important forum could not have come at a more opportune time. As many of you are aware, Maldives is in turmoil. The country is currently facing a crisis which not only threatens national but international welfare and security. Before I start discussing the current political situation, I would like to take this opportunity to reflect on the history of the Republic of Maldives. Maldives the archipelago of the Indian Ocean was run as a constitutional monarchy since 1932 and attaining independence in 1965. A few years later, a national referendum, the monarchy was dissolved and the republic was declared. In 1978, President Maumunu Abdul Qayyum began his long authoritarian leadership, which came to an end three decades later, when Muhammad Nasheed a human rights activist turned politician was democratically elected in 2008. This was a significant turning point in the his country's history. Nasheed's victory marked a new era where democracy, equality, and constitutional rights appeared to have a place. However, this success was short-lived, and a little after three years, Nasheed was forced to resign. Since 2013, President Yamin has systematically crushed dissidents within his country and strong-armed the Maldivian people into becoming helpless bystanders. Those taking a stand against his unlawful and despicable actions have been muted. 
to give you a flavor of these unsavory acts which have plagued the country, I will discuss a few significant events that have occurred in recent times. The joint opposition injected a fresh impetus to its efforts against Yamin. The alliance targeted lawmakers, convincing as many as a dozen government MPs to back a motion of no confidence to unseat the parliament speaker and his deputy. At the end of last year, upon orders from Yamin, the military locked the gates to the parliament in order to prevent lawmakers from taking part in a vote to impeach the parliamentary speaker. Thus, the lawmakers were forcibly prevented from entering the parliamentary compound. After months of efforts by the opposition, on 1st of February 2018, the Supreme Court delivered the biggest blow for Yamin's government. To the surprise of Yamin, the Supreme Court ordered relevant authorities to release all political prisoners. This includes former President Nasheed, Jumhuri Party leader Qasim Ibrahim, Adalat Party leader Sheikh Imran Abdullah, a former Defense Minister Muhammad Nazim, former Vice President Ahmad Adib, Gayyum's lawmaker son Faris Maumoon, former Prosecutor General Muhtaz Mohsin, Magistrate Ahmad Nihan, and businessman Hamid Ismail. The Supreme Court said the criminal proceeding against them had been conducted based on political motivations. It was also in violation of the Constitution and the international human rights covenants exceeded to by the Maldives. It ordered their immediate release pending a retrial. The court also annulled a previous ruling against floor crossing by members of parliament. This decision meant the reinstatement of 12 members of the opposition, which will now enjoy a parliamentary majority. Yamin declared a 15-day state of emergency after his last ditch attempt to convince the top court to revoke the order failed, as the apex court rejected the government's legal and judicial concerns over the order. The manner in which the state emergency was declared understandably sparked legal and constitutional concerns. But that was not all. Yamin has also stripped the judiciary and the parliament from the ability to mount any challenge. Effectively, he had seized control over the entire country, crippling the remaining two powers of the state. Yamin has used the unconstitutional state of emergency to crack down hard on the opposition. Police and military have made a series of high-profile arrests, including former President Qayyum, Chief Justice Abdullah Saeed, Supreme Court Justice Ali Hamid, the Chief Judicial Administrator, and several opposition lawmakers. But as the state of emergency expired, a rather desperate president executed another contentious move that has thrown the entire constitution literally into the garbage. As the state of emergency neared its end, Yamin had the day before sought parliamentary approval to stretch the emergency for 45 days. However, the opposition lawmakers boycotted the extraordinary sitting, leaving the ruling party short on the constitutionally mandated numbers of MPs to go for a vote. According to Article 87A of the Maldives Constitution, a parliament vote on any matter requiring compliance by citizens shall only be undertaken when more than half of the total membership of the parliament are present at the sitting at which the matter is voted upon. But Yamin and his followers interpreted the constitution and the laws a little differently to the rest. After efforts to convince some of the opposition MPs to attend the extraordinary sitting failed, the parliament with only 38 government MPs voted to extend the state of emergency. The number is well short of the minimum 43 required under the constitution. Since then, President Yamin embarked a ruthless process of elimination, which has seen almost all the opposition leaders arrested, detained, and kept in solitary isolation in the Dunidu Island prison, a high security prison. As we speak, a former president, a former vice president, the sitting chief justice, a sitting justice of the Supreme Court, a former prosecutor general, two former defense ministers, 
two former police commissioners, several members of the parliament, and an unidentified number of police and military personnel are behind bars, which means there are currently enough people in our prisons to form a shadow government. <laughs> Distinguished guests, <clears throat> the arbitrary arrests of the public, opposition party members, and judiciary by the police in such brutal and inhuman manners has led to gross human rights violations. The authorities have subjected them to new and increased level of violence and torture in the Maldives. Thus far, we have seen justices of the Supreme Court being dragged out of office by the military and tear gas and pepper spray being used against parliamentarians. They are only crime being upholding the rule of law and democratic values. Opposition leaders and political activists have had their homes and offices raided and have been arrested at random without the necessary warrants. Disappearance of journalists and frequent death threats towards them has infiltrated fear among us those reporting on current state of affairs restricting freedom of expression. Daily peaceful gathering in protest of the current state of affairs has led to many civilians being clubbed and aggressively attacked on the streets of Maldives and being arrested. Human rights activists are currently facing serious criminal charges after submitting a review to the UN Human Rights Council recounting current events. For the first time in Maldives politics, Families of political opponents, as well as the arrested judges, have also been targeted. These horrendous violations come as corruption within the government and its affiliated institutions go unchecked, with Modi's being ranked 112, thus making them one of the worst regional offenders in corruption by Transparency International in its latest Corruption Perception Index. When the Commonwealth cautioned President Yamin with disciplinary action over human rights violation, the President's response was to ensure the Maldives quit Commonwealth, a decision not supported by many within the country. Ladies and gentlemen, there is bigger storm brewing amidst this conflict. Though a small nation, Maldives, politics unrest Political unrest is one of the international significance on many fronts. The current problem may appear to be national at the offset. Yet the country's strategic location has become one of the great importance, especially to the regional rivals, China and India. At present, Yamin draws his strength from the support he receives from China. The recent free trade agreement Free Trade Agreement and Belt and Road Initiative between China and Maldives have resulted in stronger ties between the two countries. Maldives has also been borrowing large sums of money from China for projects involving infrastructure. The government has failed to disclose the extent of its financial obligations to China, but some estimate puts it, it at USD 1.5 billion to USD 2 billion. It is, by the way, equivalent to 80% of the Maldives' total foreign debt. Thus, Maldives is at risk of China's debt trap, which will give China huge leverage over Maldives, both now and in the future, undermining the country's independence. India is our closest neighbor and friend. Despite who is at the helm of the Indian government, they have always come to Maldives' rescue in times of need. In 1988, India sent 16,000 troops to help the then president regain control, amidst armed coup. This operation restored order in the Maldives. And in 2014, when Maldives was short on clean water due to a major fire at the main water production plant, India mobilized its navy to provide drinking water to the 150,000 population of the Maldives capital city. Unfortunately, the relationship between India and Maldives was hampered after Yamin came into power. 
China's increasingly strong presence in the Indian Ocean was demonstrated when China advised that if India one-sidedly sends troops to the Maldives, China will take action to stop New Delhi. Additionally, they boldly stated that India should not underestimate China's opposition to unilateral military intervention. Ladies and gentlemen, moving away from the current rivalry between these regional giants, there are also other pressing concerns surrounding the Maldivian crisis. These include serious criminal offenses under local and international laws, such as money laundering, illicit trade, and rogue nations, and harboring extremist religious ideologies. Under this current regime, through the slender freedom of speech and defiance of human rights, there appears to be an undertone of radicalism. Yamini's government's personal motivation has resulted in religious and conservative ideals being used as propaganda. Thus, organizations such as the Islamic State and lashkar e taliba have been able to capitalize on this and propagate ex extremist thinking. This, of course, poses a new threat, not only regional stability, but also international security. Last month, a Maldivian flagged tanker was spotted transferring goods to a North Korean tanker despite UN Security Council sanctions. Though the Maldivian government denied their involvement in this particular incident, it seems difficult for them to shy away from their role in other illicit trade deals and large-scale money laundering. The political crisis in the Maldives is escalating at a dangerous rate. The Maldivian people and the opposition parties have tried various means to reinstate democracy through attempted all-party talks with the government, parliamentary votes, judicial rulings, and active demonstrations. Any resistance against the regime is met with brutal force and silenced with imprisonment. I strongly feel it is time that the international community intervenes and supports the fight against this unruly dictator. Time is critical, and it is important that the international community acts now. Organizations such as UN, UNDP, WHO, Commonwealth and UA, EU, and developed nations, included, including the US, UK, Canada, Germany, and Australia, among others, have contributed immensely to the socio-economic and constitutional growth of the Maldives. So we look to world bodies, regional blocs, such as SAP and friendly nations, to have, all, to have always played a vital role in Maldives development, to offer a helping hand to stop atrocities from continuing. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to propose to the international community and governing bodies what I feel are measures that are needed. Firstly, the UN and the international community must take a firm stance and a direct approach with the Yamini administration. Maldives is part of a UN and the global family and are signatory to many international covenants. Therefore, the international bodies and nations must help settle the ongoing conflict by holding the country accountable to their international obligations. Secondly, in my opinion, it is time for targeted sanctions to be imposed on the perpetrators of these heinous crimes, including the president, members of his cabinet, and his aides. Actions such as freezing assets along with financial and travel bans should also be taken against the businessmen supporting the regime. Third, despite Modi's being no longer part of the Commonwealth, it must be known that this is not the general consensus among its people. Thus, the Commonwealth is well within its right to support and encourage countries such as India to take action against the Modi's government and carry out necessary high-level delegations 
led by ministerial level envoy, as seen on pre previous occasion. And finally, the international community must compel Yamin's regime to reinstate the impartial functioning of the judiciary and parliament and ensure the independence of constitutionally mandated bodies by eliminating regime loyalists who are present in all independent bodies. And the regime must be made to comply with the first February Supreme Court order without any preconditions. The international community must also help the Maldives conduct free and fair elections, one that is closely monitored by international observers on the ground. Distinguished guests, the ongoing imprisonment of opposition and lawmakers, particularly over the past few months, has sparked a lot of fury as it has highlighted that the President Yamin will go to any extent to cling on to power. He has unconstitutionally declared the country to be in a state of emergency. In order to eliminate the opposition and control brutal force and condone brutal force used against public protests by the police marshals and military officers. So far, top international officials and head of states have openly condemned the criminal actions of President Yamin. That's fine. However, this has proven not to be enough. Yamin's administration continues to carry out human rights violations under the watchful eye of the United Nations Security Council. Harbor Islamic extremism, while the rest of the world merely observes, and continues to collaborate with other autocratic countries. As this is happening in the Indian Ocean, right at the India's doorstep, which threatens regional security, therefore, in my opinion, India must act in collaboration with other democratic nations and governing bodies to explore all available avenues in order to stop Modis from becoming another failed state within the region. As I conclude my remarks, I would like to once again reiterate the need for our friends and partners in the international community to act. The time has passed to play it safe, to be diplomatic, make no mistake. Ladies and gentlemen, there will not be an election later this year as mandated by the Constitution. At least not a free and fair one, as demanded by the people of the Maldives. Yamin will not allow anyone to challenge his power. He will be ruthless and will not hesitate to adopt any means necessary to stay in power. Even if it means, God forbid, bloodshed. The people of Maldives are naturally tired. They want their hard-fought rights back. They would like to get rid of the rampant corruption that has gone to new levels under Yamin's rule. Like their peers in the developed world, they want a brighter future for their children. One that is defined by honest politics people-centric leaders and policies, and most importantly, rule of law. Thank you very much.